Hey guys, welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my esteemed guest today, I want to give a shout out to my sponsors, Man TF Up. Are you tired of feeling like you've lost your edge? Well, listen up because I have something that can help you reclaim your manhood. Introducing Man TF Up Testosterone Supplements, the ultimate solution for men looking to regain their vitality and take charge of their lives. Right now, Man TF Up is offering our listeners 20% off of their order when you visit mantfup.com slash unfiltered. You can also purchase Man TF Up on Amazon and get 20% off when you use promo code unfiltered. That's Man TF Up, M-A-N-T-F-U-P. The links are also in the episode description. You can buy testosterone on Amazon? You can buy anything on Amazon. I'm I'm shocked that you can buy hormones on Amazon. Well, it's an all natural supplement, so it's not a prescription supplement, which is kind of what's nice about it. But let's talk about let's talk about you. I haven't even introduced my guest yet. Um, she made a name for herself not only as a talented performer, but someone who genuinely loves connecting with her fans and building a community. It is the beautiful Emma Magnolia, and I am so thrilled to get to know her more today. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. I know. I'm so glad we could finally make this happen. I feel like we've been talking about it for a little bit. I've been wanting to come on your podcast for like forever. Really? Yeah. I've been wanting you to come on my podcast forever. What a coincidence. How crazy <laughs> we are today. Crazy. <laughs> so, Emma, um, as always, I usually, with my guests, start at the beginning, their origin story, so to speak. So how did you get into the adult industry? Okay, I guess I will start with my long and honestly kind of serious or- origin story. Um, so I went to college, got a biology degree. Um, I went. To, I grew up in St. Louis, went to college in Arkansas. Um, and then after college, I was sticking around in Arkansas. I had like a, like, uh, a whole array of different odd jobs that I had. I was a farmer. I was a teacher. You were a farmer? I was a farmer. Yeah, okay. I had my own farm. Can we talk a little bit more about like farm life? Because that's really interesting <laughs> to me. I don't think I've ever met someone who was once a farmer. Yeah. So when what I was specifically when I was in college, I did a couple of like sustainable farming, like apprenticeships mm-hmm. basically, and like learned how to farm. And then um, after college, I, I got the opportunity to lease a farm with um, a few people. And we just made like a huge <coughs> no-till vegetable plot and sold the vegetables at market and um, – had some chickens as well. Oh my God, it's so wholesome. It was really, good. it was really, really wholesome. But I, I decided after a while farming, I was like, okay, this is a lot of responsibility for, I was like 23 or something, 22. It was like a lot of responsibility for me at that point in time. Cause like, I just, I just hadn't ventured out yet Yeah. in my like young adult life. And running a farm is a lot. Yeah. At 23. It's a very serious commitment. Yes. And I think that, like, once I return to having a farm, I want to have, like, dairy animals and stuff like that, which is an even bigger commitment. Yeah. And so I felt like I was kind of half in, half out, and I was like, let me just do some other stuff. And so I went from that to doing, um, like, different community gardening type things. I was Mm -hmm. doing community gardening, like, food literacy for at-risk youth and stuff like that, working at shelters. Um, and then I went from that to getting like really involved in my local punk community. Okay. (laughs) And I was like living in punk houses and booking shows for like my friends, touring bands and stuff like that. It was really fun era. You have like like, (laughs) really run the gamut. You ran a farm. You worked with like at risk youth. And then you like ran punk band shows. That's like. (laughs) I've done a lot You've of lived things. a life. <laughs> yeah. And I, a lot of these things, like, there was, like, overlap in when I was mm-hmm. doing them and, like, what I was doing. Because I used to always, like, have two jobs and then, like, stuff that would be going on in my life on the side. Like, I would always have, like, a job that would pay my bills and, like, a passion job. Mm-hmm. Um, which kind of will – this will lead into how I got into the industry. Mm-hmm. But um, – The punk stuff, I promise, is related, but I was booking lots of punk shows, having a grand old time um, in the South because it was, like, really community-based. Like, all the the fun punk music that was happening at this time in Arkansas, it 
it was more often not at like venues and bars and stuff like that and more frequently was at just like our rundown houses and mm-hmm. bands would play in our living room and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like um, the way like punk was supposed to be played. How punk is meant to be. Yes. That's how punk is supposed to be. Yes. <laughs> um, and um, also there was a lot of younger people in the community, like teenage girls and stuff like that, which I think is really cool because mm-hmm. I think it's it's cool for younger kids to have um, an opportunity to have access to – music and see that you can do it yourself you Mm -hmm. know like a real DIY or die mindset from Mm -hmm. a young age which I appreciate but uh, the unfortunate part of that was that because there was adults and like young people in the same community like some of these young kids were like getting exposed to drugs at a younger age Um, and so me and my friends decided we wanted to start an overdose prevention project um, to make sure that you know these young people had access to Narcan um, and so we did like a fundraiser show and raised like a small amount of money. I think it was like seven hundred dollars that we mm-hmm. initially raised, and then we just stockpiled a bunch of Narcan and started giving it out to people. Um, and it kind of gained more traction and attention than we thought it would. And you know, I was just putting my personal phone number out there for anybody who wanted it. I was like, text me, come over to my house and I'll give you Narcan, like to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, we should probably tell people who don't know what Narcan is. Oh, okay. So Narcan is an overdose prevention drug. Um, it can stop an opioid overdose. Like if somebody is overdosing on heroin or like oxys or roxies or, I mean, opium, that probably wouldn't happen. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, any opioid drugs, whether it's press pills and also fentanyl. Yeah, Most which is relevantly. a huge problem these days. Mm-hmm. Um, which has massively contaminated the drug supply chain in the U.S. Um, yeah, so if you're overdosing on any of those things, only on opioids, not on like meth or right. stimulants or something right. like that, um, then you can administer – well, you wouldn't if you're overdosing, but somebody who's with you could right. administer the Narcan to you and stop the overdose. Like it, the naloxone hydrochloride um, – like compounds will literally knock the opioid compounds off the opioid receptors mm-hmm. and temporarily hold that space. Right. So, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That you can just do that at home. Like you don't yeah. need a doctor to stop an overdose. Yeah. Anybody can do it. Yeah. Um, and it requires like only like a five minute training to learn how to do it. Mm-hmm. So um, I would give – I would give out lots of Narcan and teach people how to use it on the spot and then they would hand it out to their friends and they would hand it out to their friends and everything spread really quickly by word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly there was a big demand in the community because this was the only source of free Narcan in the state of Arkansas right. at this time. Um, and so I didn't know that I was starting something so impactful at the time, but there was suddenly a really huge demand because we were in like a complete vacuum of services Mm -hmm. um and anybody who was at risk for overdose wanted some because the even like the pharmacy access laws in Arkansas at that time were a little bit weird like you couldn't even necessarily access Narcan at a pharmacy for sure um which is crazy now like thinking about it from the perspective of what it's like here in California which has been a harm reduction hub since since the HIV crisis yeah. um, started. Um, yeah, I had to pick up painkillers the other day, mm-hmm. and um, they had to offer me Narcan. Like, yeah. by law, the pharmacy did. As they should. Yeah. <laughs> As they should. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the overdose prevention project that um, I was working on kind of just took off, and I got connected to mentors and like, the larger harm reduction space, and if you don't know, harm reduction is like a a perspective on how people who are engaging in like risky but risky mm-hmm. behaviors or whatever, whether that be um, stuff in, that has to do with sex work or drug use or anything like that, it's ways that they can reduce the amount of danger. That yeah, as in. opposed to like completely eliminating it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like sex education in school is like yeah. another harm reduction tactic that more people are familiar with. Right. Um. But, yeah, I got connected to some mentors, and they essentially gave me the opportunity to make my project really big and get a contract with Pfizer Pharmaceutical. Um, And I took the opportunity, but in order to fully 
dive into that. I needed to find another job that was going to pay me because the project that I was starting was not like a paid opportunity. Like mm-hmm. we had enough money to get Narcan for people, but we didn't have enough money to pay a full-time worker all year round. Right. And so I basically was like, I'll do this for free, but I need another job. And I was ser- I was waiting tables at the yeah. time was my like money-making job. Um, and so I started stripping (laughs) because it's really flexible. I could strip at night and then do my like business stuff during the day and, and people could like pick up Narcan from me and like a really flexible schedule. I could drop it off to them and stuff like that. I would mostly deliver. Like we started like a hotline system. Um, (laughs) damn girl, we're like 12 minutes in and I'm so impressed by you. You like started stripping to save lives. Oh my gosh. I mean, seriously. Yeah, basically we just dived in like the most serious part of my life immediately in the interview. Um, (laughs) but yeah, so I started doing that. And then when COVID started, I I think I was like a year and a half or two years into stripping by that time. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my project was a little bit more established. We had like a small team of volunteers running Mm -hmm. everything. And we had just gotten like a drop in space Mm -hmm. that people could like stop by our office and stuff like that. Eventually Mm -hmm. I got to the point where I was like, okay, it's not really reasonable every anymore for everybody to know my home address. (laughs) Mm, (laughs) Um, Nothing bad ever happened. I just was like, it's probably not that smart. Yeah. yeah. Um, But yeah, so – and once COVID shut down, uh, like, all the clubs that we were working in, um, our the project had been a little bit more established, and so I started doing OnlyFans. Mm-hmm. And so I had even more flexibility to sink more time into the project, and then I was eventually lucky enough to be able to help it kind of get on its own feet and me move somewhere else. Wow. Yeah. That is so – you know what? God, I love that story so much. And this is why I love doing my podcast because stories like this are so unexpected in terms of like why people think that most people get into sex work. You know what I mean? It's always like, oh, you were like abused and, you know, you had no other options or, you know, all these like sad sob stories. And you're like, yeah, I got into sex work so I could like distribute Narcan to people (laughs) and like save people's lives. It's like nobody expects that story. And that's just so fascinating and just like, I mean, obviously, really amazing. You know, I'm really glad that I did it, too, because I got into dancing because I knew it would have, like, a really flexible schedule for me. Mm -hmm. But it wound up being, like, a job at the time where I felt I had more agency and dignity than Mm -hmm. any jobs I had had prior. Like, I felt like I received more agency over myself and, like, you know – I didn't have to put myself in as degrading scenarios as, as when I worked in nonprofits and food service. Interesting. So <laughs> can you elaborate that, on that a little bit more? Because obviously that goes against, you know, the current of popular opinion in terms of like what people think what people sex think is work degrading. Is. Yeah, yeah. I felt like when I got into sex work, I could make choices about what I said yes and no to. Mm -hmm. And even if I was saying yes to something that another person might want to say no to, I found myself saying yes to things that I didn't want to do more often when I was working really low wage jobs. Interesting. Like exchanging my time for money on like an hourly basis. Right. Yeah. So do you feel like because you had OnlyFans and you had a kind of financial freedom that allowed you to set your boundaries better? Yes. Yeah, because when you have, like, opportunities that pay your bills better, Mm -hmm. then your ability to say no is a lot stronger. Yeah. Which I think, you know, pretty much every woman in the industry watched transition – their ability to say no transition. Totally. Yeah. The rise of OnlyFans. Yeah, it changed everything. I mean, you were lucky to be able to come in, you know, during that wave and and come in in a place of – independence Mm -hmm. and being able to set your boundaries because you know a lot of women who came into the industry before all of this Mm -hmm. obviously didn't have that so now you've actually you recently signed with Spiegler right yes so I love you (laughs) who don't know we talk about Mark Spiegler a lot he's an agent he's probably one of the most respected and favorited um agents in the adult industry so perhaps even the (laughs) yeah yeah I mean definitely so like so you almost get to do everything backwards. Yeah. <laughs> which is great. I got and, super lucky. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about why you 
decided to like start shooting mainstream porn as we call it? Um, so I was, so I started in Arkansas and then I was lucky enough for my OnlyFans to just kind of take off Mm -hmm. once I started hustling on social media and whatnot and building a name for myself. And then I, I moved to Chicago briefly and realized that I should have just moved to LA because there's Mm -hmm. more opportunities industry related here. I, I had been mistaken in my belief that if I just moved to a bigger city, then there would be more people doing this type of thing. And then yeah. I was like, oh, no, they're literally all in L.A. It's literally – it's <laughs> L.A. Miami. or Vegas or Miami. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's one of those three. But L.A. is the biggest. Yeah. Um, and so I took a couple of work trips to L.A. and I was like, yeah, I should just live there. And so I moved here. Um, I only lived in Chicago for like six months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I moved here and started making content with lots of people who are in the industry and saw – the ways that they were promoting themselves and like finding, you know, more of a fan base through doing studio porn. And I just, I waited for a while because I wanted to be very confident in any decision that I made that you can't undo, mm-hmm. which I, I really try to be mindful of that in anything like porn related because mm-hmm. once you make, once you make a choice, you can't take that choice back. Yep. It's on the internet forever. Yeah. Which, I was I wasn't afraid of my porn being on the internet. I just wanted to move carefully. Yeah. Um and um browsers had offered me like a a special deal that felt like a really good idea to me and so I did like a package of scenes with browsers and I I'm obsessed with them. I love them so much. Great. <laughs> um, I had like the best experience ever and then like kind of partway through that I was like, okay, I want to do some more um studio porn because i'm Mm -hmm. having a really positive experience and so i reached out to spiegler and um he took me on wow yeah so let's back up a little bit um when did you so i'm assuming when you started OnlyFans, were you just doing solo content or did Mm -hmm. you jump right into working with other people i was doing solo content and i was also making like sometimes content with my with my friend do you know who sydney summers is yes she and i have known each other for like a decade. Okay. And we went to college together. Oh, cool. And like I brought her into the industry. Like she came and like worked at like strip clubs with me mm-hmm. back when we were dancers. We lived, we were roommates in like a punk house before, <laughs> before we ever danced or anything fucking, like, like that. Porn movie right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love that. She, she great. drew this tattoo. Oh, wow. Yeah. Can you show the camera? Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, but um, what was I about to say? Oh, yeah. So we we danced together and then we started doing OnlyFans together. And so she and I would sometimes make um, content together Mm -hmm. during COVID lockdown. And then I would also make content with my girlfriend at the time. And she would put on a strap on and we would like kind of like aim the camera to make it look like she was a dude with a dick. Ah, nice. (laughs) It was very poorly done. (laughs) It it, it was not fooling anybody. (laughs) Well, you know. It was mostly solo content. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then when did you start doing boy girl like what was your first scene like that with was it someone you knew or was it someone you know that you like hired specifically for that scene um my first boy girl was a collab with this guy named puerto rock okay um who i like knew this performer in philadelphia and she was like oh, i have this guy that i sometimes work with like do you want to come make like some scenes with him and i was like yeah sure just because mm-hmm. it felt like I didn't know any guys who did porn at the yeah. time. Yeah. You know, and I wanted to, I wanted my first scene with like a guy to be somebody who had some experience. Right, right. And would be able to make it look good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I made, I made a scene with him and it was great. How, how did that go? It went very well. It went very well. My fans loved it. And you they were super excited. <laughs> and there wasn't like any nervousness. I mean, it sounds like you've kind of been doing like some sex work anyways you know yeah. what I mean so it probably wasn't like such a crazy shocking experience. no I didn't, I didn't think it was crazy or shocking or anything like that it was it was it was great so one <laughs> thing that cool. I've like noticed about your story is that you know you came in you had this really positive experience it seems like you were really good at like setting boundaries kind of yeah. right away have you always been that way um I think that I really really I try my best to be good at like boundary setting and communication Mm -hmm. I think I learned a lot like around the time that I was getting into dancing just because 
I was in like a polyamorous relationship with like a married lesbian couple and like doing well or even just okay Mm -hmm. at a non-monogamous relationship like like that involves a lot of communication and Mm -hmm. understanding like how to express your boundaries and needs. Yeah. Which is not to say I was perfect. Right. At like really any relationship that I've ever been in, but I, we were all really trying together. I had a conversation about this um, the other day with Alan Emoto actually. And uh, about just how people who are in polyamorous relationships just are forced to like develop yeah. better communication skills than those in monogamous relationships. And it kind of goes against I think the general idea yeah. of of like, you know, having more than one person yeah. in an intimate relationship. Yeah. And it just seem it seems like so boundary crossing to so many people, but it forces you to establish boundaries that I don't know what it is about being in a monogamous one-on-one relationship, which by the way, like full disclosure, I am in my husband and I are monogamous and mm-hmm. we've been together for over seven years. But, you know, even with us that we have a great relationship, like I think it's like it's almost like some certain things are just left unsaid. Like this yeah. is just how you do it. And, and if you're in an everyone... relationship, you can't leave anything unsaid. Right. You can't make any assumptions if you want it to go well. <laughs> right. And yeah. I think also maybe too, because I don't know, you know, we're not raised with this idea of what a non-monogamous relationship is supposed to be like, but we're definitely raised with an idea of what a monogamous relationship yeah. is supposed to be like. Right. Exactly. So everyone figures, oh, you understand the rules. We play by these rules. Mm-hmm. But this deviance from that is like, oh, this is not like – yeah, I think that a lot of people honestly have like a, like a you know the rules type perspective on many things. Yeah, not just relationships. And yeah. I find that the the more I unpack that ideology that other people know the rules already, like the the happier I end up being in my mm-hmm. like personal dynamics with other people mm-hmm. because um, I'm able to tell them what I need. Right. And be responsible for myself in that way. Right. Yeah. What do you think has taught you that kind of communication? Is it the relationships? Is it maybe working in sex work? Is it just getting older and figuring out life? <sighs> it's like a combination because, you know, like whenever I was starting a nonprofit, that taught me a lot of like communicating with other people yeah. and like understanding other people. And then whenever I was in that like triad relationship with, um, with those two people that taught me a lot about like relationship building and communication. And then being a dancer taught me a lot about setting boundaries and that now like being in porn has taught me even more about communication because like you're having a very intimate experience that requires a lot of communication and understanding of each other, like many days of the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on how much you work. Right. Yeah. Right. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, I have a special little surprise for Emma. And um, I'm very excited to read it to her. So make sure you guys stick around. We'll see you in a minute. Are you tired of feeling like you've lost your edge? Do you ever find yourself lacking the energy and the drive that you once had? Well, listen up, because we have something that can help you reclaim your manhood. Introducing Man TFF. They're a testosterone supplement, and it's the ultimate solution for men looking to regain their vitality and take charge of their lives. With Man TF Up, you'll experience a surge in energy, stamina, and focus that will have you feeling like a brand new man. Testosterone plays a pivotal role in men's health, influencing everything from sex drive to muscle mass and fat distribution to mood, energy, and more. Imagine you wake up every morning feeling refreshed and ready to tackle the day. Your workouts become more intense, and your performance in the bedroom reaches new heights. Man TF Up is designed to optimize your testosterone levels naturally, helping you unlock your full potential. But what sets Man TF Up apart from the rest? It's simple. Their formula is carefully crafted with the highest quality ingredients, backed by scientific research, and tested for purity and effectiveness. They pride themselves on delivering a safe and reliable product that yields real results. In fact, Man TF Up is the number one product on the Amazon sexual enhancement category. And right now, Man TF Up is offering our listeners 20% off of your order when you visit mantfup.com slash unfiltered. That's M-A-N-T-F-U-P.com forward slash unfiltered for 20% off. 
You can also purchase Man TF Up on Amazon. Get 20% off when you use promo code UNFILTERED. The links are in the episode description. Hey guys, we are back. So as promised, I have a email that a fan sent to me a while ago asking me to consider having you on the show. Really? Yes. And I actually didn't respond for a very long time. I'm sorry. But I remembered it and I kept it in the back of my head. And then when you finally, we talked about you coming on, I was like, oh, I should dig this up. So I want to read it to you. And they gave me their permission. I'm not going to say their name, but they said that you will know who they are when I read it. Do you get emails like this a lot? Um, like not. Requests? I do. Yes. I yeah. get a lot of requests, but I don't get emails like this a lot. So that's why I wanted to read it. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. I'm okay. ready. I'm ready. <laughs> My name is Blink and I'm writing to persuade you to invite Emma Magnolia as a guest on HRU. This woman is going places in the industry, but it's a thing she's done outside of adult and the way she connects with her fans that will make Emma a unique and memorable interview. I joined Emma's OnlyFans at the same time I started exploring my gender identity, male to female. Oh, I already know who this is. I had been DM chatting with Emma only a few days when my first course had arrived in the mail and I laced it on immediately. I wanted to share the moment with somebody, but the house was empty. I did something I'd never done. I sent Emma a racy-ish picture and revealed that I was exploring new things this year. She responded that she loved this for me and asked how it made me feel. True fan engagement happens when the star starts asking her fans questions that evoke answers. Since then, I have shared countless pictures with Emma, nearly all safe for work. She sees the beautiful woman who I'm becoming. This has been a catalyst for accepting my trans identity and allowing me to feel comfortable in my own skin early in transition. I thought it would be six to 12 months before I would allow myself to be seen in the world, but I came out at work three months into my journey. The confidence is mine, but Emma truly helped build it up. Prior to listening to HRU, there is no way I would have reached out to an adult star on OnlyFans, but you revealed these performers, creators, as multidimensional, authentic people, many who live their lives in a non-judgmental way as Emma does. I love you. <laughs> There's tissues behind you on the, on the bottom shelf. We've been needing a lot of tissues for episodes lately. <laughs> How did that make you feel? It makes me feel so good. I talk to her like every day. Yeah. yeah. She said that you would know yeah. who it was, but I, you know, said that I would keep, leave her name out. But the name doesn't matter. The feelings matter. And yeah. I mean, this says to me, you know, that you left an indelible mark on somebody's life and a very difficult decision and transition for somebody. And, you know, someone who most of us see as a celebrity, as somebody who's unattainable, as, you know, a sex worker. Like, you were there for this person. And it seems like they didn't really have anybody else to turn to. So, like, I, I mean, just... <laughs> are you, like, how do – are you aware that you leave these kinds of marks on people's lives? Like, Yeah, I am. <laughs> Hold on. Ugh, like, I'm nasty. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but, yeah, um – it makes me it makes me really happy that I could be there for her during her transition because like to like you know the that change in life like especially for trans women mm -hmm. like it can be really isolating mm -hmm. um, and it's you know the the idea that I could make that like any easier or more supported um, to her like is very special to me yeah yeah. Like I said, this email was written a while ago. How is she doing? How is she doing now? You said you talked to her a lot. Yeah, she's doing good. She's yeah. doing good. You know, life has ups and downs. But, yeah, of course. But she's pushing through. She is, she's very good at life, I think. Yeah. Did you think that when you were getting into, like, sex work that you would be put in this place of – I mean, really, you know, you talked about doing, like, outreach programs before, mm -hmm. you know, as a nonprofit – and now you're kind of still doing the same thing in a completely different career. Yeah. I mean, like, with my, like, OnlyFans and stuff like that, I, I like to think that I build a pretty – is there a trash can? You can just throw it on the floor. Oh, oh okay. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Fuck, fuck it then. <laughs> we um, never cut to the wide. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm littering in here. But, um, yeah, I feel like I, I try to be, like, supportive and – and like inviting people to open up to me and my friendships and on my OnlyFans um, more than I really expected. I like I get to open up a space for people to just like really get to know me. Um, I 
yeah, I'm I'm lucky that like a lot of my like supporters. I feel like I say supporters instead of fans a lot because mm-hmm. like they kind of just like become part of my life, mm-hmm. um, and I have like pretty close relationships with a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, if they're cool and nice, I like the, to invite them in and yeah. and like get to know them and they want to get to know me and I feel very lucky that those types of fans have like chosen me. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the surprising things about OnlyFans is that like, yes, you have people that are there to, you know, who just want to see your vagina and you like, and yeah. I love them too. Yes, yes. I, mean, I fucking love those, those people those are fans great as too. well. They're fucking awesome. But there's a lot of people out there who really are looking for like a connection with someone, even if it's just like DMing them on a website, you know? Like, yeah. It just made me realize, and it's so sad, and I feel like it's w- even worse after COVID. And we really saw like the way that OnlyFans spiked during COVID. There's a lot of lonely people out there who um, are don't feel like there's anyone yes. that they can talk to. And there were before COVID too, yeah. you know, and I feel like we don't talk about that a lot. I'm about to get philosophical again, but I really feel like, you know, just like the nuclear family model has like been very isolating mm-hmm. for for American society as a whole. You know, like people go to work and they see people at work and they sit in their cubicle and then they come home. And the, like a lot of people just don't have a community. Yeah. Because our society is designed for like communities per se to fail yeah you know you know there's so much there that to unpack i i think about how you know here especially in like western society the idea is that you turn 18 you move out you like go to college or whatever you get married you have a kid you like live in your own place Mm -hmm. your parents live somewhere else there's a lot of other cultures where the family unit really stays together and supports each other. And here you're kind of like shamed for living with your parents. This is coming from somebody who who lives with my parents. People get shamed for having like roommates too. Yeah. Yeah. And like, um, yeah, it's just, we, we live in a weird world where people are expected to be isolated and not have friends of the opposite gender. And like, you're supposed to, like all these things that in my opinion are part of like creating like a, a healthy, vibrant life are yeah. deemed like emasculating. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> There's something about, you know, the idea that if you live alone or if you live like, you know, with your nuclear family, like you said, and you don't have extended family members that you're like independent and, you know, maybe I think probably said something about you financially. Yeah. You know, because the whole idea is like, oh, if you live with your parents, then like you're poor and you can't afford your own place. But I mean, and it was actually something that I struggled with when I moved back in with my parents during COVID. And I did that because my father wasn't well. And I did that to help take care of him. And when he passed away in January, I realized like I, you know, the idea initially was to move in for a bit, help out and then leave. And now I'm like, how can I leave? How can I leave my mom on her own to like yeah. navigate like her golden years on her own? I mean, like she cannot live by herself, and it was weird. It took me a minute to like accept that like this is this is like okay, and this is good. My daughter gets to grow up with her grandmother, you mm-hmm. know, and have that relationship with her, and mm-hmm. I get to be there, you know, for her. I was there for my dad in his last, you know. That's cool. Like, I think that should be more normalized. Life. I know. Yeah. And it's and it's weird. It's it's not. And then the other thing that you said about lack of community, that is so true. And especially the way that, you know, we've set up like houses now mm-hmm. and how everyone has a tall fence so they don't see their neighbor. They don't know their neighbor. I moved to a place where there is like a sense of community. Like we had a big fourth of July parade which was so amazing to sit there. We had a float, like, you know, and just everyone in the neighborhood. I was like, God, this is, this is so rare. Like in Los Angeles specifically. In Los Angeles, that's crazy because Los Angeles, I would say is honestly like the epicenter of like isolated nuclear family culture because like, I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me on that. But, um, you know, everything is so separated, Mm -hmm. you know, compared to the next, like the other big city Mm -hmm. in the U S would be New York where everybody takes public transit together. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if you don't have a car in Los Angeles, you can't get around. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of the communities that I know of are almost only built up because it's like people that are facing some kind of adversity. Mm -hmm. Like, so for me, I'm in a 12 step program. So the community that I feel like I have gained through, Mm -hmm 
AA is like really strong. And I feel so grateful for that. And I feel lucky that basically, you know, I'm an alcoholic and I, which forced me to find this community. Otherwise I never would have done that. You know, I'm not religious. I don't go to church or anything mm-hmm. like that. Um, and then the other community that comes to mind is like the sex work community, yeah. which again is like facing this well, outside adversity. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, why is it that all these outside, you know, problematic elements is what like bring, binds people together? I don't yeah. know. Like the sex industry is so interesting to me because like in one sense it's a job mm-hmm. and that's what is part of what's tying all these people together. But you would never see the same sense of community at like Apple or Google or something like that. Yeah. As you would yeah. in the porn industry. Like we're all like so deeply tied together. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I get that in like my like gay community as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I'm having, I'm having a ball having sex with men. Don't get me wrong. But like, you know, being a woman who dates women, like that is a really strong bond as well mm-hmm. that you can, bond with somebody just on the basis of that and do you think that that is because like you're a marginalized people yeah because i think that there's like a history of gay people like standing together yeah yeah against like a public that doesn't accept them yeah or or like structures within a society or something or something you know yeah I mean, it's kind or of a government. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. I can't remember the the author. Um, it's all like on the tip of my tongue. But he made this interesting argument about how convenience and like this kind of easier life, quote unquote, that we have um, as a society today has actually like fractured relationships and how people tend to be happier yeah. and more bonded when life is difficult and they're facing like a common enemy or something like that. There's like problem solving together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you, if you want to even go back to like, I don't know, hunter gatherer days, like you had to bond together because that's how you survived. Right. Like life was fucking hard. Yeah. I think when I was more broke, like back in the day, I had a very strong bond with all my other broke friends. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All my other broke friends gay punk friends yeah. <laughs> um but I, you know oh sorry no no no. are you familiar with like the um the like intentional communities that like frank lloyd wright designed back in the day i don't think so i would love to move to like an intentional community someday but he designed are you are you a frank lloyd wright fan um, I mean, I'm not a not, I'm not a, not, I'm not, not a, a not a, a fan, I mean, right fan. Cool shit, but I, I'm not going <laughs> to say pretend like I know a ton about him. Okay. So obviously he designs beautiful, amazing houses, mm-hmm. but he also, um, during his heyday designed some really cool intentional communities that would have like public use spaces in the middle of like basically like a small little like micro neighborhood Mm -hmm. Um, and people would have their own private rooms but they would have to cross through outdoor space to get to like a a shared kitchen Mm -hmm. or something and Mm -hmm. so everybody would still have like their own like private personal space but would be able to would have to come into contact with people in their community to get to things that they need Mm. right where where would you find these i don't know I don't hmm. know the answer to that question. Okay. I guess I'm not it. a real fan, but I guess not. Wow. you just outed yourself there. <laughs> Probably You're like the person who wears the band t shirt and you don't know more than two songs. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the two songs I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this fan, you know, this kind of all stemmed from talking about this fan engagement. Um, devoting, you know, this kind of time and attention to other people. And also, I think like, the responsibility maybe of being somebody who can help like change someone's life has to be probably a little bit mentally draining. Um, it could be depending on the day. So I mean, for, for me, I'm kind of just like, if I'm interacting mm-hmm. with somebody, I just prefer to be present if I can be. Yeah. Yeah. Your authentic self. Yeah. But I think that this is actually a kind of a relevant question overall, just because our life is, everyone's lives are so overwhelming in today's world. Um, even though I just talked about how life is so much easier now than it used to be when you had to hunt boar and gather berries. But anyways, how do you take care of your mental health? Um, I spend a lot of time gardening. This has actually been a big um, question that I've been asking myself recently because Mm -hmm. I felt like the first year that I moved to L.A., I was occupying a lot of my time 
with working and like doing social media opportunities and I kind of lost a little bit of sight of what do I like to do for fun Mm -hmm. um (laughs) other than party with other porn stars oh my god girl like I I can't (laughs) tell you like somebody asked me the other day on OnlyFans they're like what are your hobbies I'm like uh I was like shit I don't know if like if anything, like, what do I do for fun? I actually love, like, doing – just doing, like, artistic, like, nude photography. Oh, like, that's, that's cool. That's a but cool that's hobby. But also – but it's not really – it's also work. Yeah. You know it what get, I mean? The lines get blurred. Yes. I, I feel like for stuff like what we do, like, something that would be considered a hobby for a lot of people, like, taking, like, cool boudoir photographies and mm-hmm. nudes, like, before I was making porn, like, was a fun hobby for me mm-hmm. when I was a dancer and I was dating this girl who was a boudoir photographer and, like, right. she and I would do, like, little – fun art projects and like make like music videos together but now something like that is like part of how I make a living and so it's not it's still fun but I would not like classify it as a hobby anymore because it's something that I must do do you think that it takes away from the joy of doing it because now you've monetized it I think for some things it can but this is I kind of had to have a moment recently where I was like I need to do some things for fun and so I've started gardening. I started a huge garden at my house. Mm-hmm. What are you I've, growing? I'm growing so many things. I have like 30-ish tomato plants probably. I have like a ton of different varieties of tomatoes, zucchini, cucumber, spaghetti squash. I'm growing loofahs, like the sponges that you use in the oh, shower. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I would love to never buy a sponge again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that brings me so much joy. But just any food that you can really grow – Tons of beans, okra. Have you, ever, have you ever worked with Alexis Fox? I've heard that she loves gardening. She's a big gardener. Yeah. I, I feel like you guys could do like a really sexy gardening scene oof. together. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, got, I've gotten way back into gardening. I'm trying to spend more time pole dancing because mm-hmm. whenever I was stripping, like I loved pole dancing and that was really fun for me. And now I feel lucky because that I kind of like went in reverse with that one because it used to be part of what I did for a living and now it's just something that I do for fun Mm -hmm. and just like for like personal like movement and and you know feeling good yeah um and I also have gotten back into playing music which I'm really excited about Uh, I play the guitar okay and the harp now that's a new one for me I got a harp I'm playing the harp it's really fun I have a harp lesson and a guitar lesson every week and I play the piano as well but that one I grew up playing and I'm going to try to further my skills with that as well. And I'm also trying to learn Ableton, which is like a music production software, because I'd like to sample myself playing harp or guitar or whatever and make cool beats with it if I can get to that skill level. And I'm I'm lucky enough that one of my one of my fans, supporters, got me Ableton just because I expressed that I was interested in it. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm lucky. I have zero musical talent, like absolutely none, but that's okay. I don't have as much as I'd like to have, but hopefully I'll get there. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully I'll get there. But I mean, again, like it's just something, trying something new and doing something for fun. Exactly. I just want to like stretch my brain, keep it stretchy. Yeah. Um, Speaking of things that are pleasurable, uh, this is a piece of advice that a lot of my listeners are really wanting to hear. Um, What are your, what's your advice on pleasing women? Being Um, somebody who likes to be with women. Um, um, my advice on pleasing women, um, my number one piece of advice would be to start really slow. Mm-hmm. Like if you're in like a sexual encounter with a girl, always like start slow, gentle, less pressure, and then build to more. But also just ask the girl what she likes. Mm-hmm. Like just communicate a lot and have her tell you what she wants because every woman is really different and there's – no real way to guess what somebody wants Mm -hmm. I mean I guess you could guess but yeah you might not be right you may not be right (laughs) yeah so I would just say communicate a lot okay what do you think is the most surprising thing about sex work like what what have you experienced in this chosen Hmm. career field that you know you weren't expecting when you first got into it Hard to say. Um, This one's taking some more thought. That's okay. Um, 
I thought it would be more just like a a job mm-hmm. and not something that would like c- open up like a whole community of people to me mm. because I think that that's like continuously surprised me as I've grown in the industry as well. Like whenever I started and I was like dancing and stuff like that, you know, there's the community that you have like in person when you go to work. And now like since I've moved to LA, it's like this big community that's opened up and I feel like I've been held by that community. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really lucky because I'm, I'm sure that not everybody has that same experience um, mm-hmm. because across the sex industry there's so much so much variety of what somebody can experience like Mm -hmm. ranging all the way from being like a super high-end escort or a porn star or like a an influencer who just like posts their boobs on their Mm -hmm. OnlyFans, all the way down to like somebody who's not down because I don't want to I don't want to speak in a hierarchical sense but Mm -hmm. all the way across the spectrum to someone who is like a a street-based sex worker who is Mm going to have like a wildly different experience. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, the most surprising thing about my experience is that I've been able to like step into this community of, of people that like work together. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Yeah. And what's amazing is that, you know, that community did not exist like 15 years ago. You That's know, so crazy to think about. I've been in this industry for such a long time and there used to be a lot of mudslinging between porn stars and escorts. Like mm-hmm. if you were an escort, you were dirty, um, you were like debased. And if you were a par- porn star, like you were better. And like porn stars would refuse to work with escorts. That's so crazy to me. Which, you know, like, I mean, their argument was, and look, like, that's the kind of like thing about this job. It's like because it's such an intimate experience, right? And sex is so personal. Like you can choose not to work with someone for like whatever reasons, right? right. You have that right. It's so personal. It's yeah. sex. You yeah. know, you can say no for any – it doesn't you, even have to be a good reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there was like, you know, the ideas were a little bit backwards. Like, oh, yeah. well, this person is having sex with, you know – these people and I don't know if they're safe or whatnot. Well, you also don't know what porn stars are doing in their personal life if they're going to a bar and just fucking a random dude. Like you don't know what anyone's doing. And it's so silly because like also like the performers that we work with on set, like men, like I have no information about what they do off set. And this is not to say that they're acting up off set. It's just to say that I don't know. Yeah. You know, just the same as an escort wouldn't necessarily know what the the men that, that are paying to see them. Yeah would be doing right. outside of that inf- interaction. Right. And I would say as somebody who used to do a lot of HIV prevention work, I've even met lots of women who are married yeah. that d- essentially had no idea what their husbands were doing yeah. outside of when they're right in front of them. Yeah. And so this one goes out to escorts. I love you guys so much. <laughs> Y'all are real ones. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I mean, it just, you know, goes to show, like there really was this like absolute hierarchical, you know, and mm-hmm. the word sex work itself only, you know, came into like the vernacular kind of it, recently. Yeah. Like that word did not exist when I first started. in the Yeah, industry. I've noticed that some people think of sex work as meaning like prostitution or escorting specifically. Yeah. Yeah. And then some people will speak about sex work as like any everything. Yeah. Basically, which is how I usually will use that's it. That's what I think. I think any any kind of work that you're doing that's based on like basically like. I guess, and I guess enticing somebody to jerk off, you know, like where do you feel like you draw the line for that? Like getting like like orgasms out of somebody. Like, I feel like that's kind of, that's probably sex work. Right. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, the word is still like a little scary to some people. So I know some people that are maybe like topless models, like don't want to, it's like, I'm not a sex worker. It's like, okay. Fair. Fair enough. Call yourself whatever you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, what do you think is the one thing about the adult industry that people get wrong the most? I think that there's still a really big, like, misconception, um, around, like, trafficking. 
mm. in the industry and like the like false narrative that's been created by organizations like Exodus Cry. Yeah. Um, I think that's Be careful big. because YouTube might delete this video because we're talking about sex trafficking myths and they consider it to be um, conspiracy theories. Oh, should I say something else? So that no, you should cut out of the I'm video? just calling fucking YouTube out for deleting my episode with Elizabeth Nolan Brown about sex trafficking myths saying that I was spreading conspiracy theories. If anybody wants to learn more about um, sex trafficking and sex worker organizing and legalities and legal loop, legal legal traps surrounding sex trafficking, I really encourage any watchers to read the book Revolting Prostitutes. Have you read it? I have not. Excellent book. Okay. Sounds Very like something excellent I got to add to my about Kindle. I just his- finished my last book, so. It's basically about the, the international history of sex trafficking law. Mm-hmm. And it's a very good book. Okay. It's about sex trafficking law and about sex worker organizing. Okay. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. And if you want a shortened version, Laura Lee also wrote a really great essay called mm. Cash Slash Consent. Awesome. That is pretty – she she cites um, she cites uh, revolting prostitutes as being like a big uh, information source for her mm-hmm. in her essay. And I will just throw in my two cents. If you're not a reader and you want to listen to a podcast, you you could listen to my episode with Elizabeth Nolan Brown, which YouTube sneakily and very quietly put back up again after they took it down. Fascinating. Which is really weird, but thank you for putting that back up. Please don't delete any more of my episodes. Um, there's a really good uh, episode of You're Wrong About, which is a really great podcast about sex trafficking. Oh, cool. And they break down a lot of the misconceptions, a lot of the um, untruths that have, like, become these kinds of weird uh, myths. Yeah. That, um, like, it's, it's super fascinating and uh highly recommend that podcast if that's some, if you guys are not a, not a reader but you want to learn more. Cool. So, um, Emma, this has been like such a great fucking episode. You were awesome. Thank you. I heard you would be awesome. People were not wrong. And um, I just feel like you're just a testament to, you know, how incredibly articulate and intelligent and varied sex workers can be. And you just give such a fresh perspective on everything. And I'm just like so grateful that you came today. Thank you so much for having me on. No, I course. had like a really great time. Yay. Yay. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? Um, yes. My social media handle on like almost everything is the Emma Mag, T-H-E-E-M-M-A-M-A-G, like Emma Magnolia. Um, so you can, my Instagram and my Twitter are that username. Um, and then my OnlyFans is uh, Emma Magnolia XO. But – you could also just find my OnlyFans through anything else if you can find me anywhere else online. <laughs> and then you guys can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. I also have an OnlyFans. I never plug it, but here you go. It's OnlyFans.com slash Holly Randall. Um, of course, I'm going to direct you to my Patreon where you can go and support the show and access these recordings live and get um, so much other bonus content. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure that you give Emma a follow. Drop her a line. Say that you saw her on the po- her here on the podcast so she knows it wasn't a waste of her time. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>